the upside of what was going on outside is what I want to bring to your attention. See, I had another half to this, okay? Um, when, you look, when you come out tomorrow, when you come outside, if you're in India, I want you to look up in the sky. Usually we don't ever do that if we're in Mumbai or Calcutta or Delhi or any other big city. But I want you to start looking up in the sky because you're gonna see a big surprise. People are breathing better in the cities. There is no more smog numbers being reported daily of 500 or 600. I didn't look at the numbers. It would be fun to look at the numbers. They're probably almost non-existent. There's almost no traffic on the road. You might even see something remarkable. You might see a blue sky and actually witness that thing you watched when you were a child that was called a cloud floating by. You could have actually see that. Another thing is if you go down to a waterway or a stream in even where there's crowded houses, I if you look in the stream, something unusual is happening. The stream and waterways inside the cities are um, beginning to being clean themselves. And this is interesting because by the time this whole thing is over, if you keep watching, you might even see something alive in those streets. And the streets, the streets when they're, when they're empty, is what's really funny is the animals decide to take over and walk across the street and take over the streets is really funny. And they might have less food, but they really understand there's more space and they're moving around differently than they ever did before. There's all kinds of things you can notice. The way we look at mindfulness is basically um, your observation, which is the definition of your meditation. In uh, the Buddhist training, to understand how phenomena arises in the mind, how it uh, passes away, how you get personally involved with it and how it arises and how it passes away, how you get involved with it, which we say gratification, what the danger of that is. And then the fav my favorite part, the escape, how you escape it. So the interesting part is, do we really understand today? I was talking to some people this week. I don't think a lot of Buddhists really uh, get it. He really found the antidote, and he found the escape. And what he meant, what we're trying to show you, is in the time of the Buddha, irregardless of how many people were there, whether it was 6,000 or 60,000 or 6 million, I don't know, 4% is generally understood became monastics. 1% of the 4% actually got into the meditation as meditators very solidly and attempted to make the attainments. The Buddha did this whole thing, as we said last week, for humankind. He didn't do it for Buddhists. There weren't any. But when he started to teach, he was doing it for human beings. That was his whole quest. Can he help humanity reduce the suffering? And can he help them learn how to manage it better in life? I see students on here, I know for a fact, they have changed their lives completely. I see students in front of me in the names, and some of you, I can't see the faces, but if I saw all of you, I could pick a lot of you out if you are past students in the changes, the adjustments that you have made, you know, uh, from doing this and attempting to use it all the time. It's interesting because we've forgotten a couple things. We forgot what right effort is, and we forgot the meaning of Sanditiko, Akaliko, Eipasiko, Opanaiko, Pachitam, Wedi, Tabu, Vinuiti. That's something that's said in almost every tradition. But it means that what was originally taught is a challenge for you to find. And we're just going Oh, we found something that's working really well for people and allowing them to go deeper and smoother and find out how everything's really working. And we 
we know it can be easy to understand, immediately effective, meaning you begin to gradually lighten the suffering by understanding how it works. And you begin to let go, relax, smile, come back to whatever you're doing. It's a simple little recipe, isn't it? It's a simple recipe. When it's there and it's starting to grab you and you start to get tense, you let it go. Relax, smile, come back. That's it. It's not fat. It's not detailed. There were no uh, traditional head to toe relaxation things going on back then. Um, and what he figured out was all the hard stuff and torture stuff and stress stuff and painful stuff. It didn't work. We can read that to you one night and show you what happened that night. How, something changed the night he was under the tree. And when it changed in the third part of the night, he started to do something he wasn't doing before those six and a half years. And it's what changed that we're trying to, sh we think we're trying to show you. That's what we think it is. It's up to you whether it is or not. You don't have to believe us. You can drop it in the bucket at the door when you leave. If you don't want to try it, we don't care. But we want you to see it. We want you to experience it and try it with an open mind in a pure beginner's mind. Leave everything behind and just try it. You can always go back to whatever you were doing before. It's fine. But this thing was so easy and immediately effective, inviting deeper inspection because you were discovering and getting enthusiasm. I just wrote today somebody the 12 parts of a successful student. I can maybe do that with you next week. Maybe I'll hook up earlier so I'm more prepared. <laughs> I thought I was okay tonight, but maybe we'll get here earlier and try and get this going sooner so that we can, I can be sure I'm here in time to run that past you. He gave us so much nobody talks about. That's what excited me. He gave you measurable outcome charts. He gave you progress charts. He gave you uh, steps for the perfect student, how to run your company, how to run your university, how to run your kingdom as a king perfectly. He gave you the way out of, of anxiety and of stress and of depression and how to handle grief so it doesn't engulf you. He gave you all these things. It's just wonderful. So we're going to talk more next week. I've taken enough time. I'm going to turn you over to Bonte, and I'm sure we can go a little bit past our time probably with this new thing, the way we have it set up. So he's not going to be cut off. And I thank you. And stick with us. We're going to have fun tonight with mindfulness. An interesting thing. <coughs> about the word mindfulness is almost nobody knows what it means. I went around Asia for 12 years asking my teachers exactly what, is it, what were they talking about with mindfulness. And they didn't really have an answer. Mindfulness means to be mindful. Good. What does that mean? So it took me some years to come up with a definition that works all the time. Right now in the West, they use the word mindful for all sorts of different things that have nothing to do with true mindfulness. What we need to do is start to agree on different definitions that work. The definition that it, mindfulness is remembering, that's key, to observe how mind's attention moves from one thing to another. It's real important that you understand what that means. When I say watch how it moves from one thing to another, what I'm actually talking about is how distractions actually arise. 
what happens first? What happens after that? What happens after that? So it's real important for you to understand that this has to do with memory, with the way that we always do things when certain things arise and how we get caught in not being mindful, but over involved in the emotional states of I like this and I don't like that. So mindfulness and uh, craving have a lot to do with each other. You're not gonna be very clear and observant and your mind is going to get very confused and, uh, and frustrated. So it's a real easy thing to do, but it's a hard thing to remember to do. The more you can be clear with what you're doing and staying with your object of meditation, the easier everything becomes. Now, when I'm, when I'm giving a retreat, I'm going to tell you quite often, I want you to smile. Why? The more you smile, the sharper your mindfulness becomes. The sharper your mindfulness becomes, the clearer and more alert you become. And your progress in the meditation is much faster that way. Now I have a uh, a lot of old student yeah, definition of mind was control. Yes, control. That's really what That's your really definition, definition was about, control. And they thought that that was really a good thing, but they didn't see that the kind of control that they were using was craving. They didn't see that. They didn't see how craving started. They didn't remember to observe clearly how everything occurred. Right now, there's in, in the West, there's an awful lot of people that are writing magazines about mindfulness and how to be mindful and uh, they're writing books about mindfulness that have nothing at all to do with mindfulness. They have nothing at all to do with the observation of how everything occurs. And this is really important. The more we can observe without taking personally whatever it is that arises and we use the six r's and we use the smiling the easier everything becomes you start to get more and more balance in your mind more equanimity in your mind And the more equanimity you have, the easier everything becomes. You become more efficient with what you're doing while you're doing it. You, you become more happy all the time. As you take closer and closer look at how things start to arise 
and you use the six R's and you let that distraction be, you relax, you smile. You bring that smiling mind back to your object of meditation and stay with your object as long as you can. The thing with the Eightfold Path is that it's all interconnected. And the Eightfold Path is being practiced every time you use the six R's. And it helps your observation power a lot. More clarity. More acceptance. It's real important that you don't try to use mindfulness as some sort of control because that just causes more and more headaches with uh, with the craving itself. The craving and clinging really get strong when you start getting over involved with trying to control how this stuff works. Your job is just to observe. That's it. How does it work? Observe, see what happens first. What happens right after that? And as you start to get deeper into your practice, you will get to a place where your mind becomes more and more peaceful, more and more calm, more and more accepting that these things are there and it's okay for them to be there, but don't keep your attention on them. Let them be there by themselves. When you get to that stage, you start to be able to sit for longer and longer periods of time. Your mindfulness becomes exceptionally sharp. Now, sometimes when this, this, my students start to get deeper and deeper into the meditation and they come and they see me every day and they want to know, well, what do I have to do now? Most of the time, what I tell them is sharpen your mindfulness. Look more clearly at how things first start to arise and let it be and relax and smile and come back to the quiet mind. But when you're first starting out, it's hard to remember to do this practice. It's hard because you're so used to having so many distracting things arise and pull your attention away. So it's remembering to observe taking more interest in how this process works. It's, it's real interesting that it all starts from craving. That's the beginning of pain, suffering disturbance, distraction. So what is this craving? It's the I like it if it's a pleasant feeling and I don't like it if it's a painful feeling. 
So you allow that feeling to be there by itself without keeping your attention on it. And then relax. The thing that's real amazing is that a lot of people have resistance to the relaxed step, which I find completely bizarre. Well, how do you relax? Well, how do you relax? Make a fist, let it go, relax all of those muscles in your arm and your hand. That's how you relax. Do that with the tension and tightness caused by the movement of mind's attention and the lack of mindfulness. So it's a real important skill that you have to develop, but don't try to overdevelop it too quickly. Now it's real important that you don't get pushy with this meditation. Have fun with this meditation. That's what I was telling you last time. Have fun, smile, relax. When you lighten your mind, your mindfulness gets sharper. Your observation becomes much more clear and alert. And you start enjoying the meditation. Uh, for, for more than 20 years, I would go into where they were teaching meditation and there'd be 50 or 100 people doing a retreat. And as soon as I walked into the meditation hall, I could feel their concentration, but it was not comfortable. And everybody had these deep, dark lines in their forehead. Crying so hard. When you come into a retreat that I'm giving, I guarantee you're going to feel comfortable. I guarantee it because we're not trying to accomplish something. We're learning how to develop our mindfulness in a gentle way, without a lot of pushing and trying to make things be the way we think they're supposed to be. I've had some students that had been practicing straight vipassana for many years and they would get a stomach ache and i would tell them to relax into it and smile into it get joy coming up that helps your stomach ache lighten up and they would tell me well, all I have to do is be mindful and that'll take care of it. Which means that they were trying to force their mind to be comfortable so they didn't have pain in it. And I saw an awful lot of people become very unhappy because of it. So it's real important to be light with your mind, with your mindfulness. And the more you smile, the better your mindfulness becomes. The more clear your mindfulness becomes. Okay. So, stop being serious with your practice. Stop thinking that you know the way it's supposed to be. Be light with your practice. Have fun with your practice. 
just because something happens in your mind and it causes your mindfulness to disappear doesn't mean you have to get angry with it. It means that you have to laugh, smile, and gently observe how this process works. The whole thing with the Buddha's teaching is how does this mind-body process actually work? And the more you become mindful, the more you become alert as to what's happening, how it's happening, not taking it personally, not getting involved with it and trying to control it, the more you relax into it, the more clear everything becomes. And your mindfulness starts to happen more naturally with your daily activities. There's going to be times that you forget. Okay, so welcome to the human race. We're all going to forget. Don't try to push your mind to be the way you think it should be with mindfulness. That's how you cause yourself a lot of suffering, out of letting go. The more clear you become and accepting and relaxing into it, the easier everything becomes. Now you heard me ask Ardika if he's starting to lighten up. He's, he really has a habit of pushing. And he tries real hard. And you don't need to try hard. That's when you're practicing a different kind of meditation that you have to try hard. I know that there is a... I used to teach at, at Brickfields. I used to teach the uh, Samanera once a year. And they would get up in the morning and one of the teachers there would, would teach them meditation. So they would sit for an hour before they went to breakfast and that sort of thing. And they would start coming to me telling me how much pain they had in their head. And I said, well, don't try so hard. They didn't know what that meant. I told them they had to smile. Well, the, the monk that was teaching them in the morning what the, how to do the meditation, he didn't want them to smile. K. Sri Dhamananda, he would come to me after I'd been with the, the Samaneras for a while and gave them some lessons. He would come to me and he said, are you still teaching them how to smile? <laughs> and I said, yeah. He said, you know, I really liked that. He really thought it was a good thing. The more you smile, the better your observation power is. The easier it is to see when you have some slight tension and tightness becoming, the more alert your mind becomes. Now, sloth and torpor is a major hindrance. What do you do with sloth and torpor? What does it say? to do in, in the suttas with sloth and torpor. Basically, sloth and torpor means that your mind is very sluggish. 
that you're not truly observing and staying sincerely with your spiritual friend if it's your object of meditation. It's not sincere. So you have to pick up your energy a little bit and there's different ways of doing this. Sloth and torpor is real easy to let go of if you are sitting a little bit straighter than a little bit straighter than is comfortable. And you'll be able to, with your mindfulness, you'll be able to see more and more how easily you can recognize the sloth and torpor when it starts to arise. It's pretty easy to recognize. You kind of lose your interest in staying with your object of meditation. And then you start kind of lightly thinking about something else instead of being interested in staying with your object of meditation. And then you start to get dreamy. And before long, you start slumping. And after that, you turn into what I like to call as a lizard neck start bouncing. <laughs> and then you notice that you're, you're in this state, this very dull, sleepy state. And you go, oh, I got to get back to my object of meditation. So you snap your, your back so it's real straight and you really try to stay with your object of meditation, but you're not doing it with true mindfulness. And your mind starts to slump and your body starts to slump. And then you get back to bobbing back and forth. When you sit more straight, when you sit with your back almost so it's uncomfortable and you start to have sloth and torpor, you'll start to slump and you'll notice that much more quickly. And then you let go of that slumping and you straighten your back up and you come back to your object of meditation. And after two or three minutes, it disappears. One of the things that I that I do with more the more advanced students is I have them walk fast, not walk slowly. If you walk slowly, you're going to have sloth and torpor come. And there's a misunderstanding with why you are doing the walking meditation. And that comes mostly from the Burmese and they've taught the Thai to do the same thing and the Sri Lankans. And Mahasi Sayada, he did not recommend that you walk slowly. Mahasi Sayada, when he was doing his walking meditation, of course, he was up in, a, in an area where you couldn't see him do his meditation, but he told people to walk fairly fast. After he died, then the monks that started taking over at Mahasi Center, they started you walking slower and slower and slower and slower. And they say, well, you have to be able to 
get good concentration while you're walking. Walking is for exercise. Walking helps you stay more and more alert. It helps you overcome sleepiness. So walking fairly quickly at a normal pace or even a little faster and staying with your object to meditation, that is very, very good mindfulness. So the reason that you have bad mindfulness is you're not paying attention to what you're doing while you're doing it. You're just letting your mind ho-hum around. You don't have to be rough with your mind. You don't have to be forceful with your mind. And as odd as it sounds, the more fun you have with the feeling of sloth and torpor, the easier it is to let it go. Now, there's a description of sloth and torpor in the Samyut Nikaya that talks about sloth and torpor. And it says, it's like you just made some fresh bread and you want to put butter on your bread so then it's going to be just great when you do that. Except the butter was in the freezer. So you pull the butter out and you try to cut a piece of the butter off and spread it on this fresh hot bread. And it just starts tearing the bread apart. That's what sloth and torpor is. Your mind is not agile. Your mind is very, very tight. So it's a real interesting thing that when I tell you, well, pick up your mindfulness more, what I'm really saying is, you need to have more interest in staying with your object of meditation. See for yourself exactly how this process works. Take more interest in how this process works. As you do that, you start picking up your energy. When you pick up your energy, the sloth and torpor goes away. Now, on the other side of the coin, the biggest problem that people have these days with the hindrances is restlessness. Restlessness always comes from losing your interest in staying with your object of meditation. And then you start thinking about this or that. And the more you think about this or that, the more the restlessness occurs. And it actually is quite painful. Sometimes go to the airport and sit down and people watch for a little while. And you'll see that almost everybody that is sitting waiting for their plane to take off, they can hardly sit still. They have to move. And that is restlessness. Sometimes I see people with their foot tapping a lot. Why is that happening? 
because in the past they broke a precept and they feel guilty about it and that's what restlessness is. But when you use your mindfulness and you remember to observe how this process works, it's really fairly easy to let go of these kind of distractions. Now, there's a, a sutta that I particularly like to give every time I give a retreat. And it's sutta number 111. And part of the description that happens with every one of the suttas is you have the five aggregates and the five aggregates and the four foundations of mindfulness are the same process. You have a body, kaya nupasana. You have feeling, vedana nupasana. You have cheta nupasana, mind. And you have uh, I just went blank. Which one did you do? Four. Um, no. uh, mind um, object uh, dhamma nupasana. That's the fourth one. Right. Now with the five aggregates, you have body, same. You have feeling, same. Feeling and perception are always attached, always. You can, if you have feeling, you're going to have perception right behind it. You have thoughts. Dhamma Nupasana, and you have consciousness, Chaitanya Nupasana. So four foundations of mindfulness and five aggregates are just different ways of explaining the same thing. Being mindful with the the uh, dhamma nupasana the first part of dhamma nupasana is what to do with hindrances when they arise now i started practicing meditation in the in the mid 70s, 74, I think it was. And during that time, there was not a lot of Theravada teachers around. It was basically Jack Cornfield and Joseph Goldstein. They were the ones that were teaching the meditation, but they both were brought up in America with the Christian religion, and they had a lot of guilt stuff that was talked about. And they didn't really care for that very much. So they didn't stress the importance of seeing how your hindrances arise and what to do with them and how to let them go. And I can't blame them for it because the Catholic religion was filled full of guilt, taking care of this or that and feeling guilty and then trying to figure out ways to get rid of it. 
And because of that, they kind of got things a little bit more confused than it needed to be. And they were taught by their teachers, mostly in Burma, but there was Joseph's teacher was Manindra. He was from Bangladesh. Uh, Jack Cornfield's teacher was a, a Thai teacher, and he also did some meditation with Burmese. And they were taught to push away hindrances. They weren't really taught a good definition of mindfulness. Everybody thinks you're supposed to understand what is mindfulness? Okay, that's, that's an American word. We can use that. Or that's an English word. We can use that. And because of the overstressing of guilt that they didn't really care much for, they wanted people to practice the meditation and suppress the hindrances, but they didn't really understand the hindrances very much. Are not your enemy to fight with. Hindrances are arising because your mindfulness got weak and you're not with your object of meditation so much anymore. Now, hindrances arise because you broke a precept at some point. It might be a past lifetime, might be this lifetime, it doesn't really matter. What you do with it is the thing that matters. Now, when you remember to observe how mind's attention moves, that means there was a hindrance that pulled your attention away. And now you have to observe how this process works. And as you allow that hindrance to be there without getting involved with it, and you relax, Right after you relax, that hindrance mm -hmm. fades away. Your mind becomes clear. Your mind becomes alert. And your mind becomes pure. So the mindfulness is being able to observe observe this whole process and then you smile and you come back to your object to meditation and stay with your object to meditation for as long as you can so this is a process it's not something personally that you have to get involved with and try to control. That's one of the problems that people have with the meditation. They want to control it. They don't want these hindrances coming up. They don't want this problem. They want their mind to be happy. And when it's not, then what happens? You try harder. And when you try harder, the hindrance becomes bigger and more intense. And the mindfulness just disappears. And you'll be caught and frustrated, and then you get angry, and then you get depressed, and then you got all kinds of dukkha that arises. So the mindfulness is remembering let all this stuff go. Don't get caught up in it. Allow it to be there by itself. Relax. 
smile, come back. There's a lot of relief in that. Now, when you start, do, when you start improving your mindfulness, how this process works, and you start observing a little bit more clearly as time goes by, you start progressing in your meditation like you never dreamed possible. It's a real process. And I keep using that word process because it doesn't have anything to do with me or my or I. It doesn't have anything to do with that at all. The hindrance, I'm going to tell you how the hindrance actually arises. Let's say you said something that wasn't true. Okay, pretty easy. But as soon as you said that, your voice, the little tiny in the back of your mind says, I shouldn't have said that. And now you feel guilty because you broke that precept. Now that might stick with you for years. I remember one time when I, I said something to my mother that wasn't true when I was seven or eight years old. And I carried that around for 40 years. And I had this guilty feeling. And it affected the way I saw the world around me for 40 years. When I started doing more and more meditation, it came up, that hindrance came up. I didn't recognize it as such, but as soon as I started using the six R's and practicing my observation power, all of a sudden it let go. No more guilty feeling because of something I did 40 years ago. Now my mind is more clear. And it affects the way I see the world around me. So hindrances are not your enemy to fight with. They're your teacher. And mindfulness is the process that you use to let go of the guilty mind. You become more and more clear. You become more and more alert. You become more and more happy. You have more and more balance in your mind because you're starting to let go of something that you did in the past. And it clouded the way you see the world. Now it changes. Now, you become more and more at ease, more and more clear. And that helps your sitting meditation become better and you won't have as much tension and tightness arising. So it's learning how to observe this process and then use the six R's to let it be and let it go. A lot of meditation that's being done today is a kind of meditation that a kind of meditation that the concentration gets good and it suppresses the hindrances. It stops the hindrances from coming up. 
So your mind, you're with your object of meditation, your mind comes uh, to a hindrance. What are you supposed to do? Oh, I see that hindrance. Now I'm going to watch it until it goes away. I'm going to note it, which is not right effort. And then I'm going to immediately bring my, my mind back to that object of meditation. And what are you doing? You're bringing craving back to your object of meditation. So there's no real development of your personality. There's no letting go of the old hindrances because you suppressed them. You didn't do it on purpose, but you didn't use the relaxed step. Every time you use the relaxed step, you're letting go of craving. And when you let go of craving, your mind becomes more and more clear, more and more alert. Your mindfulness actually improves more and more. And you're able to see this process more and more clearly. And you'll understand much more clearly what the Buddha's teaching is all about. And you have more equanimity in your mind. You have more balance in your mind. And that makes life a lot easier. And everything becomes easier. So this little thing like this pandemic that's happening right now and so many people are so much into their fear, it's nothing. It's no big deal. It gives you an opportunity to have more time to sit. It gives you an opportunity to, instead of just sitting one hour a day, you can sit for three hours a day or four hours a day. That's what I've been trying to get our Dika to do. <laughs> but don't do it in a forceful way, do it in a light way in a fun way. Relax, smile. Bring that smiling, uplifted, happy mind to your object of meditation. Stay with it as long as you can. And you will understand more deeply exactly how this process works when you do it. You know, an awful lot of people are really interested in having a teacher tell them what to do. And I tell them that I'm not, I'm not your teacher. You're your own teacher. Teach yourself how this process works without getting caught up in it. Improve your mindfulness with practice. Don't become frustrated because you forget. Turn it into a game. Play with life. Nobody said life was supposed to be serious. I'd like to get a hold of somebody that did say that to me at one time. I'd smack them in the head. Laugh. Oh, but this pandemic, oh, it's something you got to think about this. Oh, they can only get six feet away. So what? Laugh with it. 
It's just a silly game that we're playing right now. Don't get over serious with it. That's how you improve your mindfulness. See how simple it is? The more you get clear, the easier everything becomes. When you get serious, guess who has some craving in their mind? Guess who's causing themselves suffering? You're doing it to yourself. So keep your mind uplifted, happy. Don't get caught up in making serious stuff happen because, oh, what's going to happen in 10 years when people never touch themselves? Who cares? Not going to be around that long. <laughs> so, perfect. Laugh, smile, have fun. Make jokes. Okay? Now, is that time? You took the clock away. Yeah, so I can't two minutes. Two minutes. You got two minutes. Yep. So I, I do want to let you know that we really appreciate asking questions. Please ask us questions so we can help. That's the key. <laughs> Laugh, smile, be happy. Be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May, may the, the grieving shed all grief, grief and may, may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sound, 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 sound.